So we've spent most of the morning, most of the day, in fact, recording lots of lovely stereo drum Im images. We have. Um, I think, well, certainly I've learned a lot. I, my normal reaction to drum overheads is, you know, about there somewhere, about there somewhere, crack on. Um, and it's, it's kind of as simple as that, but it shouldn't be as simple as that, is it? Well, it, it, it's actually compl it's a complicated jigsaw. I mean, it, of course, it's as simple as get a good sounding kit and then put the mic somewhere that sound good. And if you know nothing about engineering, you're a musician, you're recording yourself, you could do worse than just trusting your judgment and saying, well, does this sound all right to me? If it does, I'm going to go with it. But there's a lot of ingredients going on. I mean, you know, first and foremost is the drum kit. I mean, we've got a, a nice drum kit here. It sounds good. You hit it. It sounds good. You know, too many times I think people start recording and the kit simply, it's not, it's not right. It's the, you know, the heads are badly seated or they're badly tuned or the drums themselves aren't well maintained. I mean, I, I'd stop at saying that the drums are, uh, are bad as such. I think most mo modern drums are good. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you can buy a drum kit for nothing and the drums are round, the shells work. If you put the right heads on and you tune them right, you can get a good sound out of mm -hmm. that drum that is, kit. That's very true. You know, the cymbals, maybe maybe no. And, and, and obviously maybe a certain snare drum you want. And even when you get old drums like these that aren't round at all, you know, it's a certain kind of sound. It's yeah. the more... I think we, this is very much what I'm going to go for as that kind of on vogue kind of retro sounding drum kit. It's not a new yeah. Yamaha 9000 or recording custom one. Yeah. It's that kind of, it's very much the kind of drum sound of the moment. So, so uh, you know, on that note, I would say, you know, if, you, if you're going to tune, um, for example, if you're going to tune the toms to the song, then you need, they need to be round because you're not going to get a clearly defined pitch out of a... I mean, these old Ludwig toms, I mean, you know, none of them are round anymore. And if you try And we're not to, talking square drums. We are talking drums that have, over time, they've gone from being perfectly round, once upon a time, to being slightly... Th they might never have been That's perfectly true. round. That's yeah. true, You know, the way they were made at the time, you know, some of them would have been more round than others, maybe. But the fact is that they don't, you know, I mean, the other thing that happens is um, the tolerance, particularly as you go earlier through the 1960s with Ludwigs and things like that, the tolerance uh, of the size can vary. So a modern hoop doesn't completely seat onto the, and if they've been rewrapped, it doesn't completely, where that, that overlap occurs, it doesn't seat properly. So the, so the head doesn't sit completely evenly onto the bearing edge. The bearing edge isn't round, you know. And the end result of all this is that instead of, you know, boom, you get boom. And that can be good. Like you say, that's the Vogue sound. It's a very dry thing. It doesn't, it doesn't kind of sing in a, in a particular pitch. If you want to do this tuned thing, if you want that very American kind of um, modern, uh, metal type stuff where you've got three or four toms in thirds and fifths on the track, then you do need to, um, you know, well, you need to, it's we need to work, it's work at it. You need, to, you need to work at it. But anyway, look, you know, we digress a bit. We're good uh, at that. Get the, get the drums, get the drums sounding right. And if you don't know how to do it, you know, there's, a, there, there are, there's yeah. somebody maybe you can involve that does or, or whatever, but um, you know, get them sounding right and in, and in a way that you can repeat so that if you're working across, a, you know, on a track across a period of a day and your snare drum sounds a certain way, you know, kind of know how you got there so you can match what you did at the end of the day with what you did at the beginning sonically if you need to. Because tension lugs do move. They Especially move. Your, if your a drum, say a snare drum lug, that one nearest where you splat it with the, with the snick is going to undo during the, during the day. It's, he just is. It's going to undo, and 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 various things are going to happen. Then I mean, the, the the pitch of the drum may or may not immediately drop, but but you. I mean, the way the way I do it with a snare drum, I tend to tune snare drums to the song. I tend to do it. Well, I always do it against the piano or a keyboard, so I can get that that drum off the stand between every couple of takes and get it over to the piano and check it and I go around and get it all absolutely back. So it's always the same, and it, and it basically comes back. Now, we could get onto the fact that if people hit it slightly differently, then it's going to sound different. Let's not go yeah. there. Let's, Let's not it, go there. In this particular example, it was the same bloke hitting it. That'll be me. Um, 
Yeah. So so we've got a good so we've got a good sounding drum kit, and we've got somebody who hopefully is going to hit that in a sympathetic way. So the, there's going to be enough, you know, a, a, enough strength uh, versus the genre, mm -hmm. but not we're not going to choke those drums out. The the big mistake that you see with people is that they, they absolutely smack the drum so hard that it, the bottom end disappears and it goes thin that you know, the drum doesn't sing don't choke the head hit it it's kind of like a medium hard thing and you can see amazing sounding drummers some of the loudest sounding drummers aren't always you know the ones that hit that hard there are a couple of people that do hit the drums hard Dave Grohl for example but you know you can tune maybe or maintain your drums in a certain way uh, to, to, to accommodate your playing style. But whatever you do, do it the same, you know, throughout the track. Um, and, and what happens then is, the, is this interaction between the drum and the, and the space that you're in. You know, there's, there's all these complicated reflections happening. We, we've, we've got, I mean, let's take the example of the kick drum microphone. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a mic in front of the kick drum. When we hit that kick drum, the, the sound is going to arrive at that microphone. But what's also going to happen is that it's going to bounce off every surface in this room and it's going to come back and it's going to arrive at that microphone off axis. So depending on what the mic is, you know, how much gain it requires, where it's positioned, how it's set, you know, we're going to get these reinforcements, but you, I mean, you don't need a microphone to hear this happening. If you if you hit the kick drum and you stand next to it, if you move, then move it two feet closer to the back wall and hit it again, you're going to hear a different tone. So the first thing we've got to do is to, is to, is to put, well, we've gone to the first thing. The next thing, let me say, is we've got to put the drum somewhere in our room that is working within the space. And in some rooms, there's lots of positions that work. In some rooms, there are none. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we're, very we're very lucky here because, I mean, this is just a fantastic space for recording drums. It, they always tend to be accidental rooms, good drum rooms, in my experience. I mean, you can design these amazing studios, but the, all, all the rooms that are responsible for these sort of wonderful, like, really big kind of... Should we call them Bonham-esque drum sounds? Well, yeah, not even Bonham, but but just I mean, for me, I want I want the room to shout back a bit. I that that coupling, that reinforcement of the ambience, giving length to the to the close mic. I I don't really do those very very dry sounds very much, and I would rather have even if I'm miking very close and getting quite a dry, contained, tight sound with a tight polar pattern, for example. I do like that little bit of air in the tail and, and anyway, so that, that's just a personal preference. I understand how some people might want a really dead space, but this room... For drums, it sings. It sounds It really amazing. sings. It's, it's great. And I, but actually, I mean, I do vocals in here as well and you get the same thing, which is if you screen the singer off, you, you, you can get a very dry vocal, but there's also just a little bit of room that you can just mm. still hear which yeah. is really really nice and I, I like that pressure I like that openness as opposed to like a very claustrophobic vocal booth kind of thing which makes me feel a bit gaspy it's like a very, a very muggy kind of contained thing so it's like sort of you know overly humid days mm. <laughs> what, like of, like today you mean like today <laughs> So we've come upstairs into uh, the control room here at the old chapel. It, we know that because it says it there. Um, <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for letting us take over your studio on your birthday as well. Yeah, that's right. No Happy problem. birthday. Thank you very much. Thanks for the present. <laughs> uh, <did> that, yeah. <laughs> I did that, yeah. the mic. Uh, yeah, in your dreams. Um, tell us a little bit about this place. Um, the drum room, by the way, it, or the, the live room is beautiful for drums. Yeah. Um, you. And you also have a collection of drums which yeah. um, surpasses my own by a number <laughs> fold. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did it all start? How did um, this place come to be? Well, we've been here about 10 years. Um, and then uh, it's only really the last three or four years that I've kind of concentrated on the drum tracking side of things. Um, so we've sort of invested sort of quite heavily in like vintage drum kits and uh, snares and all that kind of stuff because the drum room really is fantastic. So um, 
we thought that was like, you know, that's our main thing really. And so sort of concentrating on the drum and sort of full band tracking and stuff like that um, seemed to be a winner really. Definitely, um, that, that, the room sounds beautiful. The drums didn't down there just sound big and fat yeah. and lovely. And the, to get all techy for a moment, the reverb time, the RT60 just seems to be right. right. Yeah. It just seems right yeah. for that kind mm. of big rock and roll drum sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and obviously tracking everything through this rather beautiful console. Yep. Uh, what is it again? It's this a is an Amic Media 51, uh, which was one of the last consoles that Amic uh, released. Uh, and the preamps and EQs are all designed by Rupert Neve, so he knows a thing a very, about yeah. EQ and and it really is fantastic. I've been really pleased with it. Mm. Um, but yeah. it's a beautiful space. I mean, mm. the the vibe is very cool. You've got accommodation. Yeah. Um, I, I want to know when I move in. Quite frankly. Yeah, it's fine. Well, I've got your rooms ready up there. So. <laughs> Um, it's an awesome space. Um, thanks again so much for letting us come in and totally right. take over and just fill the room with lights and yep. microphones. And, yep. um, uh, and yeah, so again, thank you for so much. Happy birthday. Thank you. And um, <laughs> yeah, so the old chapel at yep. Nutbourne. Not, in Nutbourne, near Chichester. That's the one, yeah, down and on the south coast. We are theoldchapelstudios.com. Awesome. And you're on Twitter and, and Instagram. Twitter and all those is, sort of yeah, things. all that is at uh, what was it at Old Chapel Studio. So, so we have our so we have all these boundaries, and they're all playing a role. And we can we can move the kit, and we can put our head at different spots around the kit if we don't you know want to get too sort of scientific about it. And we can find places where we think it sounds nice and you know focused and it's good. And we can put a mic there, and it's probably going to be a good approach. Um, but you know, moving moving into perhaps a more so slightly more technical ideas, you know, we've got various stereo techniques that we may use for our overheads to capture a picture of this drum kit. Um, we can space, we can space the two, um, left and left and right. We might want to think about the division of where the kit, because the kit, the snare sits on the left. So if we want the snare to be dead center in the, in the stereo image, then we might need to slightly rotate the, the plane of, the, of that spaced pair more towards the rack tom and floor tom sort of axis across yep. like this, rather than necessarily straight on. But, you know, that's a personal thing, okay? So, you know, uh, either we can, we can use this spaced pair like this, um, maybe Omni is going to pick up more room in a room like this. We're going to get quite a lot of room from Omni. So if, if, if we want to compress the drums a lot, we are going to be getting quite a shouty, rocky kind of tail to that sound. Uh, if we don't want that, we can go with cardioids. Um, again, uh, if, 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 we, if we go with a coincident pair, uh, or a near coincident pair, then we're going to get a slightly different picture of the kit. A co you know, cardioid, crossed cardioids in that position are going to give us a bit more snare than bloom line, which would be cross figure eights, where we're going to we're going to almost have the snare in a null, and we're going to be focusing more on the cymbals, like you might do for a sort of metal drum recording, where you want quite a lot of cymbals in the overheads and maybe not too much sort of kick and snare because you you know you're going you're going to sample replace everything mm -hmm. yep. you, you know it's really their symbol mics symbol close mics in a funny kind of way um or you could go with a very focused center image and go mid side where you've got that you know that direct uh microphone directly over the snare but perhaps and uh, you know your your sides or even a mono overhead and a, and a space pair of room mics. I mean, if you, if you pick up a stereo room, uh, mono overhead, you can get a very nice focused sort of contained picture of the kit where it's not sort of shooting from side to side, which again is a genre, very genre mm -hmm. related. So it depends what else you might have going on. If you've got loads of other stereo things happening, it might be quite nice to contain the image a bit. And I think, if you commit to that, if you're saying, oh, well, no, we're going to do it with a mono overhead, that's not the same. Uh, that's probably preferable, in fact, you know, in terms of the phase, you know, you, you're reducing the number of microphones. You're going for, you, you haven't got to worry so much about how it's playing with all these other interactions. 
you've got a very coherent picture. It's not the same as taking a space pair and just panning them to mono. You know, people pan them in or whatever. Maybe decide and go mono if that's your thing. It's certainly been a very interesting day. I mean, I've learned a ton. As someone who's been thumping tubs for a number of years now, um, and you know, playing at this engineering thing, I've learned so much just from actually trying it out. And how often do, do we, we have ever get the opportunity to actually Make just go, that right, comparison. just right, let's yeah. try this one, let's try this one, in exactly the same room, yeah. in exactly the same kind of conditions. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Hey, Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure for me. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully you find that useful uh, and we will put all these examples uh, obviously into the video but we'll also put them up as audio examples for you to download uh, and yeah thanks again to Jack thanks to Paul here at the Old Chapel my name's James Ivy and I will see you again soon for a lot more gear talk